What in God's name is that from Thorin? Right, this is another one of my Patreon donated discussions. And then there were two. We're down to two people. Now, we've done, we've done these before. The, the thing is, actually, the two-man ones, as people have noticed, the two-man one, the three-man ones, sometimes they're the best ones, actually, because obviously you're just having a conversation where sometimes if you have, like, four people, it, you know, it depends on what the mix is like. Some people, it's harder for the people to communicate with each other because, obviously, the difference is you guys know me and you know sort of where I'm at on stuff, whereas yeah. how do you know where the other people are? If, it's just your person you might have never met before. So... Zen here is going to be my guest. Obviously, I think at this point in time, you must have done... I think it's either you or Jerky's have done the most appearances on these. Yeah, yeah, probably. You've done a lot, right? So what would be uh, a starting topic? I'll come up with some myself for this as well, so you don't, have to, you don't have to carry it entirely. But what would you want to start off on? We can go anywhere on this. Yeah, we don't need to go too long because we kind of talked a bit last time, but the major is now being delayed, but there's a high risk of it being actually moved to next year because, you know, the big ones, the international and so yes. on, are being talked about. Do you see a world where it could be either played online or do you think moving to next year is the only, ch you know, better? Moving online is not an option for a major? Or what, what do you think is a, a way out of this? Like the real problem is it's kind of like what happened with the ESL Pro League. The area in which uh, ESL Pro League obviously was like the better league and had the better teams and all that bullshit because it's just you want to watch the best teams. But the area in which they got fucked, obviously, is because the teams weren't in one location. They had to split it by continent, didn't they? So, for example, like the NA one, well, yeah. even when Team Liquid won that, like who gives a fuck? We don't even know if they could have made the playoffs in the European one. So it meant it was just kind of worthless as an ESL Pro League because it wasn't. It was just like divisions or whatever. So mm -hmm. the problem I see is if you do it online – surely you'll just have to split it up because there's like no way in terms of ping. I think you yeah. can make it work and be like reasonable because listen, as much as we all whine about like fucking people playing on like 40 ping, no one's going to watch anyone play on 150 ping. It'd be so guard Like the orpers would be complete trash. Like people, the pistol rounds would be a joke. Like it would just ruin the game. So I'm with you. I think unfortunately it either happens in which case, you know, things have to like improve soon or it probably just gets pushed to next year because there's no point risking it. And then you have to add in as well. This is a part that people really haven't thought about. I know everyone thinks, but maybe it can be like I am kind of eats in. If the players can go, they can just hold the tournament, right? I'll give everyone a quick lesson in economics, right? I'll just give you a random number. I'm not going to say the exact amount, but this is a ballpark figure. Let's say to run the major costs $1.5 million. That means, and by the way, when you run the major for $1.5 million, you are definitely going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, if you're already going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I then tell you, by the way, there'll be no fans getting tickets, so take another hundred or two hundred thousand dollars off that. I mean, in this case, not because it's in Brazil, so there's no fucking way. So maybe take 50k off. Dude, you can't afford to take 50k off when you're already losing money. Like, at that point in time, what is the point in putting the event on? Like, if I'm ESL there, I'm just going to Valve, and until I can have a live crowd, I'm telling Valve, either you pay for all of this shit, or I, I choose not to have this as my major and give it to someone else, or wait till next year and let me do it properly. Because just business-wise, it doesn't make sense. Like, people haven't thought this through. Yes, it'd be brilliant for us fans. We'd get to see an awesome tournament. Like, the kind of beats the playoffs are still fun. But what? remember, it is first and foremost... For people like ESL, it's a business. And so if the business makes even less sense, there is no point putting the event on. Yeah. And so if we know that that's true, what, what happens to all these qualifiers that go on? I mean, obviously they become... <laughs> yeah, it's the problem, isn't it? Because that's, that's the part no one's talking about. It's crazy. We're hosting all these regional major ranking terms and there's going to be more of them. But if we end up having to do the major in like a year from now, we'll just have to do more, won't we? Because that also then will be out of date. And this literally will have meant nothing or you'll have to like add more. And personally, I, I, I listen, here's the thing. I agreed with hosting them now because we were shifting system anyway and we weren't going to use the system where people got invited and that was crap anyway. So in, compared to that, it's better. Yeah. But if you do the qualification a third time over... I actually think you've ruined the competitive integrity of the major at that point in time. Like, what if I qualified twice and I don't the third time? Isn't that a fucking joke? Yeah. You know what I mean? I know, listen, I get the angle that you want the teams to have qualified recently, but that's a really hard angle to go with. The only way, in my opinion, you can get around that is if you go to the qualification system I actually think they should use anyway, which is instead of having specific tournaments, you just use the circuit that exists. Yeah. 
Because then it's like, it's still slightly unfair if I qualified twice. But at the same time, to a fan, I don't think they'd think about it as much if it was like, yeah, but you, you came last at ESO1 Cologne and DreamHack, whatever, Masters something. It'd, it would seem to the fan fair that you didn't qualify there, you know? Yeah. But I'm with you. It is mad because essentially we're running these tournaments now, pretending they really matter, but they actually might just be the equivalent of like a glorified online cop. <laughs> yeah. Which makes them kind of sock in a way, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. And all, I mean, all these teams that are surprises and, you know, people getting annoyed, teams disbanding and then all for nothing. It's just seems such a waste. And also one thing no one's talking about as well. This is how you know people are just insanely biased for certain leagues and against certain leagues. Right? Mate, if we do minor things at a certain league called Flashpoint, in just even a way people don't like, we don't even do anything wrong. People act like we're just morons, right? How is nobody talking about the fact that the number one team in the world, which definitely isn't Fnatic, by the way, that doesn't even make any fucking sense at all. The number one team in the world's Na'Vi. Bear in mind, we've already had like three meaningful tournaments and they were like in the finals of two of them. So the idea that, right, Na'Vi, the team that everyone probably thinks would win the major if it was held tomorrow, is getting their qualification points playing all the CIS teams. That's just stupid as fuck. That's insane yeah. if you think about it. Like, how unfair is that for like the sixth best European team? I mean, that's the classic problem, but now it's even worse because yeah, because obviously the good thing is not fun. exactly the good thing is in the past at least the Navi's and Gambits of the world when they were good they were never going to be in the minor, so yeah. it, it wasn't like they would qualify for free because they were already in the major. But now, yeah, they've be, we've basically regressed it. I also don't get that myself either. I know obviously we have this system where we have the CIS minor. But bearing in mind, all those teams can just play in Europe. Why not for this one, since it's online, just make it shared qualifier? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, that, that would make the most sense. But I mean, again, probably for nothing, so... Yeah, I mean, well, the real sad thing about that, that I learned a long time ago, mate, is whenever someone says that they care about, like, oh, I have, like, strong values and I care about this and this is wrong, what they're actually saying, translation is, uh, the thing they have strong values about, it, that means I like that. Uh, the thing that's really wrong, I don't like that. That's it. Like, it's not what they said at face value is just nonsense. So, yeah. put it this way. Bearing in mind, everyone wants Navi to qualify for the major. I doubt even even someone who was a fan of another team would complain because, like, well, I want all the good teams at the major anyway, don't I? Yeah. You know, our friends with Waylander and so on might qualify. So, yeah, it's not, not the hardest. Oh, and by the way, actually, if you didn't see this, um, DreamHack actually cancelled all their events for the rest of the year. Oh, wow. So if you combine that with all the other stuff, remember, DreamHack's parent company is the same as ESL. That makes me think, A, there's a good chance the major gets shifted. I mean, I've personally heard, forget whether or not you could have a major. I've heard behind the scenes, forget having a major in Brazil. Like, that ain't happened, I've been told. Yeah. Just in based on the, just on the way they're handling the current situation. And then secondly, and this is probably the maddest one, this is where, like, if people like me and Richard didn't exist, I wonder what the fucking world would be like, mate. I guess I already know because it is like how I think it would be. Well, at least some people get the inside scoop, right? How has no one put this together as well? Oh, all the DreamHacks are cancelled. As I've mentioned a million times, in that MTG's financial report, they say they have to shed, like, you know, like $13 million this year. Wow. That, that's a code, by the way, for, like, cancel everything we can, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, but not even the online. I mean, that's going to decimate the tier yeah. three. Yeah, that's why it's actually helping ESL in a fucked up way. I mean, here's the thing. I guess it was the coronavirus that caused some of the loss, so it's not entirely. But the fact that now they just host it online means they save a fuck ton of money. So in a way, it's like it sort of like took with one hand and gave a little with the other. It's still fucking them, unfortunately, because their entire company is like tanking. And obviously, when you get to the size that their parent company is at, it's all about the stock. It's not even about how much money you make, is it? So when the stock goes down because the entire market crashes, yeah, you're in deep shit at that point in time. That's where I'm glad, like, Flashpoint is not, isn't something that's with the company that's on the fucking stock market, is it? Yeah, I still, I mean, not Flashpoint itself, but the, the teams, all the teams are now in a big trouble. Like, if they're spending, you know, millions with contracts and so on, and there's not even tournaments to send people to, I think it's... Oh, the, well, here's the sad thing, mate is, listen, I obviously don't want that. If I could, As much as the ESL are the ones getting fucked, 
and teams that didn't sign with Flashpoint. If I could flick, click my hands now and make it go away and not just go back to land play, of course I'd do that. Because as far as I'm concerned, we're going to beat them fair and square, mate. Even if they don't play fair and square, by the way. We will win. But what's fucked is no one's noticing it because of the coronavirus excuse. But it's not that that's made the scene wrecked. It's just accelerated when these teams would run out of money. It's just meant instead of running out of money next year or in two years or having a downsize in three years or the inflation goes up and you just get left behind, it means that this year you have to make the change. This year you have to cut someone. You have to sell a team for cheaper than you'd want. You have to bail out of a game. You have to get out of a league. That's why you see all those Overwatch fuckers starting to slowly pull back and either like sign cheaper players or just get rid of the big names or tell them to go to Valorant and play that game. That's, that's the thing people haven't... I don't think people have realised. And that's also where... People are going to think I'm saying this just because it's Flashpoint. But Flashpoint is the least affected in terms of the groups of teams, of all the teams in Counter-Strike. But that's totally logical, dude. Because think about it. To be in Flashpoint, you had to be someone who was willing to spend $2 million to join, potentially pay all the fines, eventually have to upgrade your roster. And so basically, we already got the people who are willing to spend the most money now, knowing that you have to do in this model to win, to stop at just losing your money in 10 years and get nothing for it. Yeah. I mean, and that's not even that much money. Because if you compare it to a Overwatch slot that is like 10 oh, million, it's sick, or 30 million or whatever, and the, like their best player is moving to Valorant, like what? Like with Sinatra, it's just crazy that they're, yeah. How can they ever justify the 30 million slot now? Like if, if it's clearly going to die. The thing is, that's the mad thing is I'm thinking about doing a video on this topic, actually. It's just that, believe it or not, for certain things like this, the tricky thing is I might have to get like fucking legal help to find out like whether people can fuck me up from it because, right, you know, one of the main things that was set up to basically convince people to invest in the Overwatch League was they had a report um, paid for by Morgan Stanley, which is like a world famous financial organization. Yeah. Now, that is a private report. I believe it costs something like $10,000 to buy that report. So first of all, already an obvious fucking Ponzi scheme where you just make, all right, buy this report with all the secret info that's definitely real because we're the knowledgeable people. You buy the shit for 10K, it's absolute nonsense from front to finish, mate. It's fucking mental. And even worse, bearing in mind, who commissioned this report? <laughs> oh, and then they get paid if people buy it. It's like, I, again, without saying anything that can get me in legal trouble, I think the people who wrote it, to some degree knew it was bullshit because they're in it, right? Like any good financial document, they don't just say stuff like it will succeed in this way or it is going to do this. What they do is they do three cases. They give you the base case, which is supposed to be like, you know, what 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 would like be like the average scenario that had happened. They give you the bull case, which is obviously where it goes awesome, probably the best it can go. And they give you the bear case, which is where it goes as bad as it can be, Right. Mate, you should see what these fucking numbers they give are. So here's the problem. If you make the bull case really crazy, yeah, because that's because you imagine everything goes right. Like, you know, it gets on TV and it gets a sick deal and broadcast rights and fucking Coca-Cola sponsors everyone. Like, I get that. But the base case, as you can tell by the name, shouldn't be that far off fucking reality. Dude, the base case contains information. Like, they predict that they'll have like 7 million viewers in the playoffs. Because they did a survey and they claimed that like 40% of Overwatch players, players there, not fans, not viewers, players of the game, 40% say they watch esports. By the way, didn't say Overwatch League because it didn't exist then. Didn't say Overwatch, just esports. And so because 40% of them say they watch it, don't know if you're aware of this, mate, humans can lie. Secondly, you didn't interview everyone, did you? And then thirdly, and this is the kicker to me, so because they say 40% of the people surveyed said they watch it, they just took the entire global player base of Overwatch, it was like 30 million, and then 7, 7 million is about the average of that, you know, for the 40% or whatever. Like, <laughs> That's so ridiculous. But, but I mean, or maybe it's 20 million that I guess it was 40%. Whatever, it's still insane. Yeah, whatever it's it was, still a it? ridiculous amount. But it's basically, I, I can almost forgive them like at the time maybe if i'm investing okay i'm a vc i know that 10 of the 11 companies i invest go to zero and one is going to blow up maybe this yeah exactly like that. that logic now, makes sense i agree but now it's like okay this was already launched this is the size it's not going to 10x now it, it can only you know maybe double if, if it's doing great but it's not going to be anything that would justify 30 million it just seems to me it's so ridiculous like it just i i really don't understand 
even from Plus, a DC point of view. Here's the thing, mate. With how much they actually have to spend for those teams, and then also, remember, because they were going to the homestand thing and then they were eventually going to go to home and away games, the costs only go up. Like, part of that, by the way, which was implied, but I don't know if it was ever explicitly said, was that when they go to the home and away, you have to have built a stadium. <laughs> so forget that you've already spent 30 million and then, you know, maybe like 5 million on player, on payroll, and then maybe you already had a practice facility somewhere. Now you have to build a stadium. Let's say that's even cheap. Even if you do it for like 200K, actually, what am I saying? 200K, that'd be a fucking slum, wouldn't it? Probably half a million, a million's probably the most reasonable, right? If that facility for probably TSM more, costs yeah. 50 million, we're talking a few million. So, like, not only are people now looking at it like, fucking hell, I don't want this. Like, for some people, by the way, who are of actually going, they're loving that the coronavirus happened in as much as it means they don't have to do some of these things now. They can delay it. Because oh, I yeah. agree. Like, I don't even think 10Xing would do it. I think legitimately they might have to, like, 30 exit to get anywhere near Because at the moment, still nobody has monetization. Because the only monetization, obviously, is sell sponsorships at the moment, right? Yeah. To make the kind of money we're talking about, yeah. we might have to 100 exit. Yeah. yeah, that's like, the, you would have to almost be like the viewership of football or something mental, I think. Because remember, they have the fo- viewership of football, then they have like sponsorship is like their, I think it's like the third or fourth highest like income revenue stream for football. So they have like, you know, the ticket sales, the jerseys, everything, broadcast rights for TV, et cetera. Like any idiot who thinks like, oh, look, that. They got a hundred million dollar broadcast rights deal. Cocksucker! They bought everyone bought in for seven hundred million. Who's that helping? <laughs> <laughs> like the problem with that is, I get it. To you and me, hundred millions lords. If we've just spent seven hundred million, it ain't lords, is it? It's fucking nothing. Uh, the, those broadcast rights is something else I don't understand. Like you know, a few years ago, oh, it's on Twitch, right? It's free. No one's paying anyone, as far as I know. And now it's like. Tens of millions for... Broadcast. There's a lot of fuckery behind the scenes on Jesus that. Jesus Christ. Like, basically, this is... what One of the amazing things about esports is it's actually taught me so much about the real world where I've never been an investigator. Like, now I'm learning about the financial world. I've definitely learned a lot about the political world. I've learned a lot about how generally business people interact and negotiate. And all I have to tell you is, it's not that, like, esports is becoming corrupt. It's that every single industry, once it scales to a certain point and gets a certain amount of public interest, the corrupt people just come in and do their shady, underhanded shit. And because there isn't any rules or regulations, that's an advantage. It's like if we're playing Monopoly and I play straight up and you slightly cheat, I might not always beat you, but you've got a pretty good chance. So the problem is, by default, if you allow like an unregulated system like that, you're going to get loads of scumbags who come in and just do all sorts of shit. So I have to say... There have been many scenarios in the last, it's only in the last two or three years where it's been egregious, where I've seen deals that publicly made no sense, but privately they make sense in the same ways. Like I'd give you this analogy. You know, um, in America, they spend like the most money in the world on their defense budget, like all the missiles and the fucking tanks and stuff. And they obviously keep even ordering the shit even when they don't necessarily need it right now. Like they might already have enough troops somewhere, you know. Yeah, but the whole right, reason it keeps right. going... Yeah, the whole reason it keeps going is because it's called that thing, the military-industrial complex, is a business. So what they do is that even though it's a government buying all the guns and tanks, right? Well, who think about it. Who's who's competing against you for that, like, order? Like, if I'm the U.S. government, like, oh, hey, uh, company, I need uh, 100,000 tanks. It's not like they then go, fuck off. I've already got enough work. They're going to go, oh, yes, please, give me that contract. But here's the mad thing they behave in the government as though it's the other way around. And so they give these things to the contractors called no-bid contracts, which is basically they say to you, hey, Zen, how much for all these tanks? And you just say, yeah, a billion. But in reality, it should have been even just 700 million. And then they cause, and then I just say yes to the deal. But the reason I say yes is obvious because literally behind the scenes, obviously you just put 50K or 100k yeah. or, or 10 million through some sort of weird bank and I eventually get it or someone I know gets it or, you know, there's a million ways to do it. If you're clever, you put levels of abstraction, obviously. The problem is that's basically now coming to esports. So yeah, at I the mean, moment, because think about it, right? The guy who does that deal at Twitch or any of these things, it's not his money personally. It's part of a budget. And if he's going to spend that budget anyway, listen, 
I won't say the last part, which I gave you in that example. So if you follow through, I won't yeah. say how it'll eventually benefit him. But anytime someone does a deal that, as you say, doesn't make any sense, because in that scenario, you're right. They had Overwatch completely over a fucking barrel. It should have been the other way around. They should have been getting a discount from Overwatch League. Instead, they gave them, as far as I can tell, like the best deal ever. Yeah. Yeah, and even the Morgan Stanley guy or whatever, he only makes money if they then broker deals. So he's not just interested in selling the I, am, I would he's, imagine so, yeah. He's, he's interested in, in you know, buying some teams and getting the 10% or whatever percentage of the of the value of the deal. And obviously it makes sense to say that they're worth loads. Yeah. And yeah. also add in as well, if you've already started selling esports reports for 10K and then fuckers buy them, let's figure out some more esports we can write these 10K reports about. So if it turns out that the first one's shit, mate, people are going to lose faith in esports and not going to come to you for that sort of thing. So this is always why, like, it's not that people only do things for money, but it's like that, Basically, the problem with money is it can be an incentive that, like, incentivizes you to do fucked up things that, like, you might have borderline done anyway, but now it's like, well, I sort of wanted to do that anyway, and you're telling me I get rich if I do that. It's like, well, fucking it's game over, isn't it? Like, there's so many people who's going to abuse that. Yeah. I still think that the corona thing, I mean, obviously it's bad because it's killing live events and so on, but it is bringing a lot more people online and doing everything, and games are being played way more, and Netflix, sure. all this type of stuff, so... I do think that they might, you know, flip this around and say, well, now esports is going to grow even faster because people are now home and they think it's great, or at least they got... I mean, in a way, maybe it will. I mean, I'm sure like streaming and stuff's probably going way up, right? I mean, I can tell you right now for stuff like Flashpoint, we were getting numbers you should never get for the teams that we had. Dude, we were getting like numbers for like, you know, like Havu versus Cloud9. I know it's Cloud9, but mate... Let's be real. There's not millions of Americans going to tune in because it's fucking just because the name says Cloud9, are they? Like, so when we were getting some matches that were having, like, obviously the best ones were the Brazilian ones because MIBR has all those extra fans on MIBR TV. But even some of the other games would get numbers that were like, mate, a few years ago, that's what like an ESL or clone, like, quarterfinal would have. Yeah. And like in League, I think the LEC final was just record breaking. I mean, it was a decent game, but geez, it was like millions. And it's like, where did this come from? It's just, yeah, it's bigger justification. I still don't see where the money is going to come. Yeah, it doesn't really make money from it, you're right. But yeah. Uh. Especially because it's not even just about getting more hits. Again, just like I gave the example with the no bid contract. If I come to you and ask for sponsorship, right, and I want, let's say, a million dollars for some reason. So this could be any snack. It could be a TO, it could be a, an org. I want a million dollars for this sponsorship, right? And here are my numbers. My numbers are whatever. I have like two million views that I'm going to give you. And let's say for whatever reason, that's worth a million dollars to you. Yeah. Right, next year, I come back and say, now I have four million. That doesn't mean you just have to give me two million dollars now. Yeah. Why does it? No. If you just say, I'm only going to give you the million, what do I tell you again? Go fuck off. No. Secondly, if we all get to double our views, aren't we in exactly the same boat? Because yeah. we're competing against each other for the sponsors. So I, it's like, in theory, it could help. But again, you're right. The real problem, it's not the stupidest thing about esports is we've already got the viewership. Like the viewer numbers are mad for League of Legends and stuff. Yep. The problem is none of the fuckers are paying any money to anyone and no one's figured out how to get them to do it. And any system that would involve them having to pay would risk losing some of those numbers. And the number one rule of esports business, right? Despite the fact, obviously, when we talk about Overwatch League, they're all idiots and they're all losing their money. But the number one rule is they're all scared. They're all scared money. So as a result, that's why they all stay with the herd. That's why they all just do whatever happened in the past or anything that's slightly worked in the past. They think, just keep doing that over and over again. Maybe it'll work. And so the craziest thing is, it's not that all those teams went to EPL because they actually think that's a sick deal. They're just scared. Like, well, what if I went somewhere else and then that shut down and then maybe there isn't an EPL and then there's nothing to come back to. Oh, shit. It's like, and they're thinking, so they're just thinking of like what they're going to lose, not what they could gain. Whereas I, I don't know how much you know about business. Every successful businessman is the guy looking at like the what he can gain and then finding the smartest way to get to it. And you have to have a risk to get there. Yeah. Like I can't think what business in the world you can just only gain money and not well, maybe like fucking run a bank or some shit or casino or something. But obviously our games are far from that. 
Yeah, but I think the thing is, it's been so long that any team made money, they just look at top top line revenue, and you know, if if users go down, they're just afraid that the top line goes down, and so they they will never risk it. Actually, yeah, it's because basically you have to risk everything that gave you success before to get to the new world. It's just that I always use this analogy. It only made sense to say I'm going to stick with what I had when that could succeed. As far as I know right now, I'm not aware of a single person in the entire industry who has a, an actual plan for how the current system can succeed. Even ESL don't. Like, Here's the thing that people really don't get about the ESL versus Flashpoint thing. When you factor in all of the like sneaky language of how they explained what the profit share was, right? So you know most fans just read the top line and they were like, oh, wow, the teams get uh, 85% of the rev. No, that's like after like three or four different calculations, which include taking out the expenses for the league, like ESL's cart as an agency, but that's not ESL, but it is ESL accident. No, like they did all these levels of fuckery so that in the end, if ESL and Flashpoint made the same money, which obviously is not a premise that's necessarily the case, but I'm just using it as an example. Yeah. Essentially, ESL would make uh, 10 times what like the teams make as far as I know. In Flashpoint, there, I mean, well, there is no... No ESL. The teams just make the money. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's where uh, I think you remember like a, a couple of months ago, H2K Rich did those math on yes. how much an LCS team made. And basically, bottom line is they make no money except maybe the top ones. Like, yes. It, it was a total. They all just run off investment still. And that was like in the old days where the numbers were a bit unreasonable, but still numbers I could recognize. Yeah, now exactly. It's just millions and millions. I almost wish that someone. I, I, yeah, someone with with the information would put that out because that would just yeah clarify so much shit and just. I mean, I might be able to do it now that we're all at home and I've got some time off because the thing is, I've now got people. I mean, some of them obviously are even in Flashpoint who are owners. I, another thing fans will never understand. Probably the dumbest thing that this is how you know your average redditor doesn't actually know much about the world or esports. Whenever you see them comment. Have you ever seen anyone, when they talk about me hating on someone or being wrong, have you ever seen them ever actually acknowledge that I could have information or know people they don't know? You never see it. They all assume I'm like them and we're all just sat behind the PC just watching stuff and that you're just making up your opinion. So what they don't know is, like, mate, I can go to fucking Steve Arneset and just ask him what's going on. I could go to someone in EULCS LEC now and say... Uh, do you think the contract that your rival star players got, like, would you bid for that if it was available? Like, you think he's actually worth that money? He's like, I can ask them all this shit. doesn't yeah. mean I always do. Like, sometimes it is just my opinion. But I can actually get that info. So I know and have known for a long time, a lot of the owners know that shit's out of control and they want th things to change and they wish the player salaries weren't where they are. But at the moment, again, because they're scared, they don't want to show weakness, right? So at the moment, they won't just come out and say... Well, you know, players complain about salaries, but we already lose money paying the salaries anyway. And so, like, the only people who do that is people in the Flashpoint League, because the whole point, that was our premise to set up the Flashpoint League. So I actually do have plans, I just haven't executed it yet, to do a series of articles like this, where I would sort of take you into the industry. And obviously, I couldn't name names unless, like, I mean, someone like Cloud9 might even go on the record, who knows? But, you know, what I would have to do is I would have to phrase it like this. A large esports event in Germany, which gets X number of viewers could get this much money, but it would cost this much money. And now, so my idea would be to do it in three sections. One would be the tournament organizers, because again, plenty of tournament organizers have been friendly me with me because the same thing. I'm, You know, I'm one of the only people with Richard who actually promotes the idea that they lose money and that it's a problem and that the moment is no system. Richard, Richard Lewis? No, no, Richard Lewis on this yeah, one. Yeah. I guess Richard, Richard <laughs> does as well. But we're, we're some of the only people who do that yeah. because the others... Here's the saddest thing of all, mate. You know, the people like the HLTV.org writers and stuff. It's not that they're like cocksuckers and liars. I mean, they are liars. But in this particular case, they just don't know. I'm not exaggerating. They just don't know any of this shit. They don't know any of these fucking people behind the scenes. They're, so as a result, they think, they see like ESO and Claude sold out again. Wow, that must be a great, it's like, shut the fuck up, dude. Like, what are you talking about right now? So the crazy thing about all of this is, I want to do a three-part series. One would be TOs. One would be orgs, as in team. And then one would be players. And what I would show essentially is TO and orgs obviously just get absolutely wrecked all day long, no matter who they are. Like the ones that don't basically are, are sort of cheating the discussion. Like telling me that like FaZe Clan or fucking TSM makes money is like saying that your 
uh, rich cousin who works in McDonald's uh, is rich because she works in McDonald's. It's like, no, she's already rich. And then she also works in McDonald's. Like the, the McDonald's part is like, you know, the $300 a week. Yeah. The rich part was coming from somewhere else. So to tell me that FaZe Clan is making money, yeah, because their business is putting people in front of webcams and just getting fucking insane money off it. That's a sick business. Putting the same person in a massive stadium and losing loads of money, that's a shit business. So everyone basically loses money. And then what I'd love to show you is how utterly bonkers what the players are making relative to the other two pieces. Because then people had realized, like, we're in a mad world. And part of it obviously is, I mean, it's the fault of some of these people because they couldn't keep their dick in their pants and they had to all try and outbid each other when they could. And then they never understood when it's when you're in a world where, like, I eat you because you're the small fish and I'm the bigger fish. Well, you understand, unless you're the fucking shark, another fish comes and eats you. And that's what's happening. Yeah, there are loads more fishes. <clears throat> and even, I mean, I think the, the, the next step, you shouldn't, you know, put all the info there. Just keep some for those consulting fees after, because that's a clear. I mean, I'm sure companies. If I'm investing, you know, thirty million in a slot, I should at least talk to someone who knows what the fuck they're talking about. And that, I mean, maybe it's obvious behind the scenes who these people could be, but at, I mean, right now it seems to be, you know, you rich, like you say, maybe Monty, but otherwise it's just people who blow smoke Man, up your ass. You would, you would be shocked how rarely we're asked to consult. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, but one of the reasons why is this, right? Think about, right, imagine a massive businessman coming into esports. So the first contacts he's going to make in the industry are the businessmen of esports, the Nikola Nihoms, who want him to come in, who want his money in his business. So when he then tells them, because by the way, these guys are dumb enough to do this, mm -hmm. basically say to a wolf, like, can you recommend, I'm a sheep, you're a wolf. Can you recommend any good sheep uh, chefs? Like, that's almost what they do. So what they do is when they ask those guys, well, can you tell me like a good consultant so I can learn the space? They're just going to tell him the guy that thinks esports is great and is going to do all these gangbuster numbers, you know? So essentially it's sort of a rigged game in that sense. Yeah. So the problem here is I don't think people would want to know what we know. Like they'd have to be the sort of businessman who was very, very diligent and careful and didn't just want to take a flyer. Like he was saying, we well, take 10 flyers and you just see which ones work. So I actually think also we haven't, we've done a terrible job publicizing it. Like as much as you might think, because I have loads of Twitter followers, like, oh, you must be well known. So like no one in business world knows me, mate. Like when I meet people from like newspapers and stuff, if they aren't from esports, like when they're talking to me, you can tell they think I have like a fucking blog or something. <laughs> it's mental. Yeah. Like, I've told this story before. When I went to the Overwatch League when it launched, I was supposed to have tickets, right? Because fucking Monte Cristo himself asked for, like, you know, me to be put on the list. Yeah. And then when I was going up there, right? Remember, in theory, everyone in the Overwatch League works in esports. The people who were at the desk were just saying, like, uh, hello, um, who are you? You know, this is the press line, right? I was like, yeah, I'm here for press. And then they were like, um, what uh, publication do you write for? I was like, oh, I don't write for a publication. I have a, a, a YouTube channel and I'm a freelance journalist. They were like, ah... You see, this is sort of for like um, accredited press, you know, the big names and stuff. Like, you know, I mean, there'll be time for you to maybe submit a request online or something. And I said, oh, no, don't worry about that. Like, I'm on the list. Like, I should be there. So if you could maybe contact someone. And they were like, okay, what name do I give them, though? And when I was telling them the name, you could tell they'd never heard any of these words I was saying before, mate. They literally knew nothing about it. Like, they just lived in some fucking bubble in, like, I don't even know where. And the best thing was, probably the funniest part of all this was, the people behind me in this queue at, like, the press line were all, like, super low-level shitter journalists from Twitter, but who had, they were on the list. And so they were all looking, and you could even tell some of them were just thinking, like, what the fuck? Do, do they not know that story? But, like, here's the key thing. Firstly, because I think it's funny and just because it's actually not my personality. I'm not the sort of person to be like, don't you know who I am? I'm Thorin. I'm the greatest esports at no. I just, you know, I just, I thought if this person really doesn't know, let's see how far we can go with this. Because what I want basically is for them to ask for like, you know, a manager guy to come and then him to get another guy. And eventually they're going to eventually have someone who knows esports, aren't they? Which is what happened. And then that person's going to go, oh, this is Thorin. I'll just take him in now. And But what about his past? I ah, don't worry about that. Just bringing him, you know, like it, that's obviously going to happen. So, that's just to show you, though, mate, if there's people working in esports don't know who I am, 
how the fuck is some business guy going to know? He's just never going to find me, is he? And unfortunately, he's going to find some absolute... You, you can guess who some of these people would be on Twitter. Yeah. He's going to find some absolute idiot who even says they're a consultant before me. And then they're going to look at their Twitter feed and go, hmm, seems like he talks a good game. And then they're going to pay that idiot money. And yeah. sadly, some of those people, like you were saying about the Morgan Stanley aspect, they are corrupt in the sense that basically... They're stupid enough because they've never had money in their life and they've never been like a big time player who's dealing with millionaire businessmen. They really think, oh, I better tell this guy what he wants to hear. It's like, you know, that's literally the opposite of what he's hiring you for. <laughs> like, you know, if he thinks it's going to be really successful and you know it isn't, in theory, when you then tell him and explain why it isn't, and if you make a good case, he goes, phew, yeah, I had to spend 10K for you, but thank God I didn't actually invest the 10 million. Like, fucking hell, thanks. You did me a great favor, man, mate. It's worth losing 10K. But this idiot doesn't think that. He just goes, but if I say something he doesn't like, maybe I don't get the 10K. You know, like, yeah. they're just like children in that sense. So basically, I do have plans in the future. This is one of my, like, almost like semi-retirement plans yeah. is I want to build up on the side a, a consulting company or be part of a consulting company. But what I'll do initially is I'll just put, like, you know, a block of say like three hours in my schedule each week and I'll have a set fee for those hours and then the idea is someone who wants to go at, bring me in as long as they're not an idiot pays for an hour or something and I just gradually build it up and then the idea is it's something that in the future if it's a massive industry I could just flex in that and do that full time because obviously I'd have the resume for it so it's I like a lot of things if you're not known you have to network and you have to build up your connections basically yeah so speaking of that I you haven't I, I haven't seen you talk too much about the Valorant side of uh, esports and so on. Um, I think we don't need to go too long. But basically, my question is: there's already talks about salaries being insane in some teams. But on the other hand, Riot isn't saying, "Okay, we're going to blow this up." They're saying we're going to take it easy for a while. Yeah, they're being yeah. a bit cautious. So, w what do you think will happen? Is is this becoming? You know, like league year one, or is it more like league year three or four, where they, they put the money in and it kind of is a something that will, uh, you know, be a, a sport like like league or, or CS. Well, here's the thing: people, I don't think have stopped to think about is one of the reasons. There's actually a few factors here. One of the problems with esports, right, is when we look to esports history and try to take like lessons from what happened, we don't tend to take the lessons. We just use that logic of like, X was the cause, Y was the result. So if X is the cause again, Y will be the result. But the problem is there's like a bazillion factors in the world that are all interacting and many of them are of that time period. So for example, when League came out in 2009, streaming wasn't a thing, mate. And streaming esports games was a thing, but it was very small and it was super shit. And to have huge numbers back then, like a, a huge numbers for a Counter-Strike match would be like, 30,000 views. That would be like the world finals of IEM. Yeah. And by the way, they'd be bragging like motherfuckers about those numbers. And also, those numbers were probably viewbotted and embedded on shit and all sorts of shady shit to get to that 40k. So let's say in reality, it was like 15k. But remember, if you actually think on a reasonable level, 15k people watching play CS live in the moment, that's actually pretty sick no matter what it is. Like, that is cool. It's just that now it isn't cool because of what, how much money you have to have or we need to make in the future. So basically, I think one of the reasons that they waited all those years is they were just they were just a small game dev who made a game. And it took years before they knew that there would be all this demand for uh, viewership. Like when they made their game, how did they know that that game would be a big esports game? Remember, Dota wasn't a big esports game. The original Dota was the equivalent of like, I'm trying to think what game yeah, I could it was contrast a custom it. map for Warcraft. It, well, here's the thing though, it was played like as an esport, but, but it was like, like a really one. small yeah. esport. Like it was like the 10th biggest esport. Let's, let's say that, okay. Yeah. So as a result, it's not like when they launched it and they got millions of players, which they did, they knew that millions would watch. So as a result, I personally think Riot genuinely just thought, well, of course we'd let them run the tournament. Like they're the tournament organizers and we just make the game. Ha <laughs> ha, this is cool. And then once they started to see, which is basically what happened, the I first IEMs, even when it was in like season one, dude, they were getting viewership that was like better than the CS match that would be like the best teams in the world. So the ESL obviously just started to think, hmm, wait a minute. And then the other part people might not know is 
because this is why I think it was all a test. Basically, to get their game into esports circuits, League wasn't actually picked up organically. Riot literally would go to the ESLs of the world and tell them, if you run a League of Legends tournament, I'll just give you all the prize money. Hmm. In the past, ESL used to run the tournament, get the prize money from Intel, etc., and their other sponsors, and Riot just sat back watching like everyone else. Mm -hmm. So there were all these mad incentives to the TOs to run the game, which is why they did it. And then once Riot saw, fucking hell, this is doing gangbuster numbers, and we're paying for it anyway, why don't we just run it ourselves and control it? Like, why would we build up ESL and then have them, you know, hold us hostage one day or charge us? You know, why, why even do it? Why don't you just do it ourselves? So essentially what I'm saying is, even though right now the streaming part of Valorant is popping off, nobody really knows what the esports side will be like just in terms of like organic viewership. Yeah. So I think they're scared that it's like Overwatch, where Overwatch, because this is the part everyone seems to forget about Overwatch. Dude, do you remember when it first came out? It was beating League in terms of like Korean PC bang numbers and stuff. It was like, in terms of a casual game, it was doing awesome. So as a result, people thought, well, if as a player base, it's doing this awesome, just wait for the esports side. And then as we all know, the esports side just never, ever got anywhere close. It was always tiny and it was just a player base remained huge. So the thing I think is they have to wait and see, otherwise they're just going to lose loads of money, how it's going to do in terms of like, RTO is going to pick it up. How heavily are they going to invest in it? What's the viewership like? Because remember, one thing about the world that has changed now is when Riot actually were the ones who owned their game, or at least even before they'd sold all their shares and they still had like some controlling interest. And also, even when they sold all the shares initially, this is like, you know, like four or five years ago, yep. still Tencent was sort of like, right, we own it, but you can do whatever you want and we'll just sit back and, you know, just keep making money. But then what happened basically is over the years, Big Daddy had to keep exerting more and more control. And then as you might've seen in the last couple of years where you had all that weird stuff, like the world's being fucking remotely broadcast, that basically I can translate that for you, mate. No one thought that was better. That means someone came in and said, oh, by the way, I'm slashing your budget like a motherfucker because I think you're just wasting money on this. And in fact, as people know, supposedly Tencent told Riot Games, you will start developing other games. Because you know, before they used to like develop these games and then just let the project die and go, yeah, maybe not. And they would just let, just put it on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> Made a <boy> so, game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as far as I know, in fact, that's what Valorant was. For years and years, this has been existed as a concept. It's just that they kept getting dropped. It was just in the initial phases. And so as far as I know, I think that all Riot games now have to really do well business-wise. And if they have any esports component, that has to do well business-wise. Like you can't say, oh, awesome, the game's making... 5 million a month, but we're having to spend a million a month on the esports side. Like the Chinese people are going to be like, then why the esports side? Because they're businessmen, you know? So uh, as you can see, before I even have to give you an opinion, it's already set up where it seems likely that the initial period will be like League. It's just, there's no guarantee for me that they'll ever go to the part where they do all the LCS and stuff. Because I think the only reason to do the LCS angle is, I mean, it's kind of like Overwatch, you just trick people to pay you, right? <laughs> That's the only reason. If you basically, do you want half a billion dollars? If you do, do it. But if you want it to be successful, I don't even know if that's even possible. Yeah, yeah. Now that what's I your thoughts on it? What do you think they would do? <clears throat> yeah, now that you mentioned like there are other games, because I mean, I, you know, I played TFT when it came out, Legends of Runeterra when it came out, but I've stopped playing them. Like, the oh, I remember everyone saying while. TFT was going to be a huge esports game as well. <laughs> <laughs> as though Auto Chess was ever going to be watched by like millions in stadiums. Like, why are people so stupid? Man? I don't get it. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, may maybe it'll be another one of those. And yeah, Overwatch is a good example of something that did seem like it was going to be great, and now actually it isn't. So that yeah. seemed like it genuinely had like one of the best chances of any new game I've ever seen. Yeah, and it had you know big big guys behind it, etc. But still not not enough. I mean, there's another thing about Valorant that I find very unusual. Right, the reason everyone's praising the CS side of the game, by the way, is because they're all the plebs that aren't from CS. So as a result, like they're basically the equivalent of like, um, oh, I'll give you an example just to be mean, because <laughs> why not? Right. Travis Gafford once told me he's a huge fan of Nine Inch Nails, right? Mm. So I don't know if you know this, but technically the genre of music that Nine Inch Nails is in is called industrial music. Okay. So I said to him, all oh, right. Do you, do you, if you love them, like you must like these bands, or have you ever checked out this one? And he basically just said, like, oh no, I only like Nine Inch Nails. Like, I, I don't know or care about any of those other bands. And I was like, 
but it's the same genre though. You know, there's like he's like, nah, I don't, I just don't care. So to him, you know, he just liked the catchiest version of that music and one specific band. So my problem basically is where did I start? Where did I start on that point? Valorant is not going to be huge. Yes, that was it. Basically, to me, um, the people who are saying it's like CS luckily are wrong, which is what gives it a chance to potentially succeed as a casual game. Because I don't think you could make a CS game. I I mean, even when they made CS, it didn't succeed casually initially until they made all the skins and shit. So I don't think a very CS type game can do that well. It definitely can't do super duper well because let's face it cs itself doesn't have 100 million fucking registered accounts or whatever like league suppose you do but let's imagine it flexes into the other aspect of the game the abilities and having op shit and making crazy mad players happen that would never happen in a cs game yeah that's going to be awesome for single player and not single player public player yeah. so just like overwatch other games it's going to initially have a pop-off but i don't actually see how that ever actually gets you to the esports side basically and in fact, I kind of feel like the more successful you are at the casual game, the harder it makes it to do the esports side. Hence why all the public sensations in the last five years, PUBG, Fortnite, over, they all kill it in terms of the public player. They are fun games, but they can never make the transition. Yeah, even Overwatch eventually gave up on balancing and just say, we're locking roles. <laughs> like we can't, we can't balance these abilities. So you can't have three tanks or three supports or three whatever. Yeah, it, it it might be very hard to make it competitive in that sense. What was the other part about that? So I think I missed part of it, didn't I? Not being a big esports, or compared to TFT, or compared to CS. Because mm. I mean, here's the thing, right? Te- would you technically count Overwatch as a big esport? I mean, like you say, it's they did pay that much money, and in that sense, it's the biggest contract. So yeah, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Like, it's like here's the biggest problem with the Overwatch League, mate. If they were really legit with the numbers, obviously they'd just shut it down after a year or two and stop losing money, wouldn't they? Yeah. But instead, they were never going to do that. Like, not only because they've built this big lie that it's going to succeed eventually. So the one thing they can never do is say it's not succeeding. So I've even heard rumors behind the scenes that Blizzard might just straight up like fucking like low key privately bail out some of the Overwatch League teams. As in, teams will come to them and say, I'm not going to keep fucking wasting money on this. So you know what? No matter who I am, I'm either going to put a budget roster in or I'm just going to leave. And I don't care what I paid actually. Fuck the sunken cost fallacy. I'm out. And listen, if you think it's bad when like the players leave, dude, imagine a big org just leaving and just saying, oh, we're off actually. So as a result, the counter to that, and in fact... The real move, I doubt they'd actually go and say that. What you do instead is you say, all that stuff I just said, I will do. But of course, if you were to help me with some of my operating costs for a year or two, while you know, we wait for it to succeed. Like, you know, you give me a few million and it just helps me run my Overwatch League team. And that way I don't have to budget the roster and I don't have to start to leave the game. and I don't have to say anything bad about you. Yeah, I can just keep, you know, it can be business as usual. Except the joke is that phrase is totally inappropriate because it's not business, is it? You just fucking... You're doing some sort of mad, like, socialist bailout or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like, in that scenario, the joke there would be, why would Blizzard do it? Because they want to get more people involved. They want to get more fuckers investing. So it actually might be worth it to them to spend 50 million on these teams if it means they get another 200, 300 million through the door. Yeah. They do have all those millions in the pocket, so I guess. So basically, if Riot choose to do that, I mean... It doesn't matter. It could have zero viewers. It it could still, in theory, be a big esports game for years, couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I still. Then why are teams already paying big contracts and so on? Like, if if you're Sinatra and you're the best player, one of the best players, why would you switch games when you? Could... I've got a good analogy for you. Yeah. So you know when you hear all these stories, and it's the reason esports is getting bigger. That like, oh, the average age of like the NFL viewer. I think the average age of the NFL viewer, by the way, is something like 50 years old. Average. Like that's like, holy shit. That yeah. really puts it in perspective in your mind. Like, man alive. Right? So because the average age is so high above the demographic they want, even though we don't have the monetization, we have the initial conditions that they want, that they think can eventually lead to it. Whereas in their old sport and their old business, they don't have it. So my analogy I always give is... It's like me jumping out of a building from the fourth floor. 
I'm not doing it because I think that I, I'll land perfectly and I'll feel awesome. I know I might break my legs, but what I didn't tell you is I'm locked in the room and it's on fire. No. So if I stay, I die definitely. If I jump out the window, I'm taking my chances, aren't I? It still seems better than staying in the fire and dying. So that's not only what the mainstream media, traditional sports are doing coming into esports, but that's exactly what people do in esports. So everyone who was on the whole Overwatch League hype or some of the other PUBG hype, they're just looking and thinking, fuck, those lottery tickets, as it were, didn't work out. I mean, I've lost so much money. I'm going to need to win the lottery to get it back, right? Fuck it, buy the next lottery ticket. And at the moment, the good thing I will say about Valorant that they never had in Overwatch, as far as I know, is it was only very rare people like Seagull, et cetera, who were really getting the big numbers for streaming and all that sort of shit. Mm -hmm. Like the esports side was never that big. The streaming numbers for the people streaming, especially all the, I mean, again, it's unfair because we've now built up this whole industry of streamers who shift games, but those numbers seem very encouraging. So as a streaming business, maybe it will make sense. Like maybe I'm signing these players now where, yeah, they're going to play in the first tournaments because I plan to test the esports waters. But at the same time, say there's a tournament every month, the other three weeks, my, my dude, who's a really popular streamer, is just streaming and we're just all making money from that because, you know, the costs are way lower than the than the profit, uh, than the revenue. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't thought of that. I mean, even though, I mean, when TFT launched, it was all so crazy numbers. And now it's like just, I mean, it's not that, but it's like, you know, highest streamer is like Scara with like 5K or something. Like it's not. And then also, remember, you've got to always add in. There will always be some dig hoony type motherfucker deal. <laughs> where someone comes in and then yeah. they've just got such a weird sense of business that it's like the person, imagine going to an auction and thinking, no matter what, I want to win this object. You'll yeah. just go to the ends of the earth. What You'll bid 10 times more than it's worth. Whereas anyone who's doing it for business reasons will know what the item's worth, what the maximum they could sell it for. And the second it goes even close to the maximum, you're just going to not bid anymore, aren't they? Well, the problem is there are always going to be fuckers in the industry. These are the ones who inflate the industry who just want to get that player. And so this is the maddest thing of all, right? I'm not exaggerating. Some of these people might have a purse of like $30 million and then they will spend millions on one player. Like, have you ever played poker online? Yeah. Basically, you go broke in poker if your bankroll's less than something like, it should be probably like 20x. Yeah. Because just, you know, even if you're the best player in the world, you can just hit that variance streak of three months where you keep getting fucking kings in oasis and you go all in. Like, you know, you get all the nightmare scenario. The guy pulls a fucking royal flush on the river out, you know, some all the bad shit can happen. And so it doesn't, an idiot would think, right, well, I just need like a thousand and then I go to the 100, 200 table and, you know, I've just got to have a good game, haven't I? It's like, no, because if you go broke, you can't play at the 100, 200 table anymore. So as a result... This is why most poker players constantly go broke, no matter how good they are, is because if you have like 10K bankroll, you should be playing $1, $2. But the problem is you're going to think, I'm not playing with those bums. I, I, I've i got 10K. It's like, well, you won't have for long, mate, if you go on that $200 table. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially if you get, you know, a big signing. And Huni is not, I mean, he's a big signing in theory, but then not in paper. And then you don't have the rest of the pieces because... Yeah, you couldn't get them this cycle or something like that. That's the maddest part as well, mate, is in every other game, there wasn't the massive salary inflation when the game was in beta. <laughs> the salary inflation happens once the game started to succeed. Think about how crazy this is, right? Listen, obviously, motherfuckers like Shroud will probably make loads from streaming anyway. He's actually a pretty safe person to buy on for your team yep. if you could. But the one I don't get is this, is the people signing guys who are like just a really good Overwatch player, just a really good CSGO player. There is absolutely zero guarantee they will make it. I mean, mate, do I need to say more than this? CSGO, it's not like 1.6 identically, obviously, but it's, let's say it's like 50% of CS 1.6. Dude, the fucking goat of CS 1.6 is a bomb in CSGO right now and was at best like... Above average, I'm talking about Neo, obviously. Yeah. yeah. If that, if the, if the oh, game that's not even that much yeah. different, he's that much worse. Who the fuck knows what people are going to be like in Valorant? And again, think about any game you've ever followed. The people who are good in year one, <laughs> half of them are gone by year four. Yeah. Maybe more. Maybe eighty percent. 
Yes, I guess just more like crazy investments. Year one, still people don't it's really know. risky. Isn't it? Sinatra is still, you know, relatively safe as he's American and stuff. But if you're signing a, like a Korean import or something, then yeah, it's it's even. Basically, if you're signing people just based on how good they were at another game, that doesn't really make any sense at all, does it? I mean, mate, that is really like when Michael Jordan went and played baseball. <laughs> he obviously is a sick athlete, and you know. Maybe if he'd stuck with it, he could have gotten good, but he was never going to be what he was in basketball. That goes without saying. And the problem is, luckily in that case, they obviously didn't pay him like he would. But the analogy here would be, not only are we bringing Michael Jordan to baseball, we're going to pay him his salary from the fucking baseball, basketball. <laughs> Even though we've never seen him play. Well, we've seen him play for two weeks in this scenario, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, one we haven't touched on, it might be just the same story, is... What do you think is happening to Dota? Because, I mean, they move the international and they basically are everything is around the international. So are they even more screwed than everyone else or is it just, you know, same story? Um, one thing I'll say that is a positive for both League of Legends and Dota, in my opinion, is even though if you're Korean, 60 pings on playable. And if you're American and I have 60 ping and you have 30 ping, you'll notice a difference if you're a good player. It's not anything like CS. Right. Like, like obviously in CS, if you if I have twice your ping, it's not that I'll notice a difference. It's that I'll, I would probably have to be like twice as good as you, maybe more to win that game. Like think of the mad advantages you'll have on me. So the problem I have basically is... Um, Dota, as far as I know, actually is a game that online, from my own experience watching it, it's actually, I think it's closer than games like CSR. Like, you can, it's actually more legit in terms of the results. You could have, like, you know, not the international, but you could obviously have, like, a regional major online, or you could fly all the teams to, like, you know, one location where they don't meet anyone, and then they just play and there's no crowd. You could, you could do all these things. Mm -hmm. But again, it's kind of like the ESL example. It's like, who's going to want to host live events when you just not going to have a crowd or who's going to host live events where it has to split into regions. Cause again, listen, the European region will be banging. The Chinese region will be pretty banging too. North American region will be fucking God awful. So I think to me, a major or an international split by region isn't a major or international. So at that point in time, you will just call it something else. Yeah. I do think they're fucked though, unfortunately, especially because it wasn't last year's, wasn't this year, this year it was supposed to be in like fucking China or something? Or is that next year? I'm not sure. That might be next year. I'm not sure. But also the number of players is slightly decreasing with CS going up now. Yeah, that's a bit bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. I also don't even get why that is, to be honest. Because the thing about Dota is, the kind of person who likes Dota, aside from the fact there's all those shitheads on Reddit, like they're not a pleb in the same way as other people. Like As far as I know, the kind of person who likes Dota, it's a bit like CS. You're kind of like a bit of a hardcore player. So as a result, you're not like, oh, if, if, if this Fortnite game's good, I might switch. To you, it's like, well, no, I, I don't play games. I play I play Dota. You know, that's, the, that's my shit. Yep. So I actually do think that it's a bit weird that the viewers, the numbers go down. Because again, surely they should be getting a spike now from everyone being at home. Like, doesn't everyone love Dota? I also think, to me, I won't lie, I think Dota's the best balanced game in the history of esports. They're doing a fucking amazing job with that. So, like, one of the things I've always loved about Dota, contrasted with League, like, you, you watch League, right? Yeah, and Dota. And do you, oh, you watch Dota as well? Well, one thing you'll know then is one area that Dota is amazing compared to League is, so you know when G2 plays in League of Legends, all of us are just coming in our pants like, oh my God, look at the way that they can just turn any situation around and they yeah. can come back into a game and they can come back from a deficit and then they can play through a different lane and they can do something unorthodox and do a pick you don't expect. It's like, all right, so you just mean like every top daughter team ever then. Yeah. And that's not because the teams are better than G2 is in league. It's that the game doesn't let you do it in league. In Dota, that's like default. Like think about it, dude, Alliance won a fucking international because they were losing Nav against Navi in team fights in like TI3. So like fucking Lorder or someone just started like split pushing, doing like rat daughter. Yeah. You yeah, can't do that in league because they've designed the objectives. So you, you just can't at certain points, you know? So one thing I've always loved about Dota is to me, it's the ultimate, this is why I'm amazed everyone's so toxic. It's the ultimate game where you're never out of it. If you're not an idiot. Yeah, and the balance is way crazier where, you know, there are, there is OP shit, but it's on both sides, so... Exactly, it makes it fun, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, listen, you've got an OP thing, right? Fuck it, let's, let's us pick some OP shit, and then even then, you have to be creative with it. It's not you just... Like, here's the thing, right? <laughs> Dota has a few ridiculous abilities and, like, concepts, 
But it doesn't have just press R type Carthus shit, does it? Like, it doesn't have stuff like that. No, no, it does have the concept of like the one and two carries where, you know, like the, the example in League I was watching today, like Knight in the LPL finals, and he's like killing them with mechanics and dodging everything and so on. And in Dota, if you have those mechanics, you can really carry, you yeah, know, yeah. kill everyone 1v5. You know, it's more like CS in that sort of regard, I agree. Yeah. But the, the, the opposite point is, you know, people just get older. I mean, I used to play Dota only, and then now I play League because, and I play Support, which is the least intensive mechanically, just because I have Carpal Tunnel. So it's, you know, people just can't... I've got a question the, for you. Yeah. Because you know it often shocks people to find out that the main game I play is League of Legends on my own, yeah. and I just pick the champions I want. I always play Support. That's my main role. Yeah. Well, what's funny is... Like when I tell people in the modern day I play a pike, it almost makes sense that it's it, like like that's all I always say. Like playing pike as support isn't even League of Legends; it's a different game. It's like I'm playing a mini game, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just playing some other shit. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, I can just fuck off it to everyone's lane. Like like I often tell people, one of the things I love about that is that's what made me love League again. Is because the reason I didn't like it was. I can only play like three games as fucking Nami where my ADC never goes in. He lets me get killed. I try to save him. He then goes back in while I'm getting killed. He dies. And then, you know, like level four, we're down two kills. And you're just like, Jesus, I'm locked into this motherfucker for 40 minutes. Meanwhile, if I'm Pike, the second he betrays me two times, see you, mate. All right, Tristan, you sit under your tower, mate. I'm going to go and snowball all the other lanes. And you know what? The amount of those games I win is mental. Because, listen, I am at low plat, like, at low levels, rather. Like, I'm not playing with people who actually know what to do against that. I'm playing against idiots who are just like, this is unfair. The support's in the lane killing me. It's like, yeah, fucking really? kills go, brrr, you know, like, just don't give a fuck. So, but that's the difference. That almost fits, like, the Thorin persona. The thing people wouldn't realize is, I'm not exaggerating. When I'm saying I used to play support before Pike existed, I was... 24 7 spamming are you ready i was an ego motherfucker Janet. i was spamming lulu Jana, nami i would occasionally play a thresh but even then i'd be like fuck this is a bit intense you know like feels bad when i miss that hook or you know like i fuck up the flash flare like i like i'd do the fucking flare before i flash or whatever like you know feels <laughs> and by the way there's no more feels bad as a support than when you do the fucking ultimate but like in the wrong order you know and it just doesn't doesn't even trap anyone in it you just feel like a moron yeah. whereas exactly. like right, right. Mate, you can play J- Janna and just turn your brain off. It's fun. Yeah. You just go, all right, well, let's just have some fun. I'm never going to die. I've got fucking boots of swiftness or whatever. Like, I'm just going to run around. I'll get out of there if it goes to shit. And then here's the thing people wouldn't realize. This is why I want to ask why you play support in that sense. The most OP shit about League, and I also think this is why so many people play it, is it is nothing like CS or... I would even say daughter as well in this sense, that you really do need to look at your screen all the time in those games and focus all the time. And I actually personally don't even play music when I play CS because it triggers me if I don't hear the sound cue or, you know, some key detail gets lost in the comms. If I play League, there is no voice comms, so I've got music 24-7. Or I'm watching a fucking talk show on the side or catching up on a podcast or anything. I could even be messaging someone while I'm walking back to lane. Yep. Like that's bonkers, but it also means because it's such a low investment of my attention, it's just very easy to play. And so in a sense, it's more fun. It isn't in the like gaming sense, but it's more fun in the sense that, you know, you can sort of do three things at once. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was also, I mean, historically I played Jana because it was, you know, completely overpowered in the first three. Oh, so sick, it was it? like 54 win rate forever for years and years. And then, yeah, I switched more to CC just because Janna was, you know, changed too much. And for me, actually, my main now is Malphite, which is even stupider. Uh, it's just you, you use the ultimate and they die. It's, it's just, there's no, you don't have oh, it's to middle. The first 10 minutes, you just wait in line for level six and then you go in and, and you kill. It's, That's one of the most cancer yeah. champions in the game for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Pike is better because you get double money or triple money for kills, uh, but uh, True that. Small fight is just... yeah. You, oh, no. You're in kill. By the way, I also totally understand that I'm playing a, a champion that shouldn't be allowed to be in the game yeah. because I'm not joking. Listen, again, I'm not saying I'm playing at a high level, but even so, like general win rates should make some sense at all the, re- all the different levels, mm-hmm. right? Mate, I'm winning way more than whatever the average win rate is at my level. Because like I say, I'm just doing like mad roams 24-7. The point is the people who are playing at my level don't even understand what roaming is, do they? So they're just staying in the fucking lane no matter what happens. So even if they play a pike, they're not doing it. But 
it, the, if you actually know what you're doing on Pike, it's so unfair. Like, because for example, just the W alone, it's just like Ezreal. It's like, unless you're a decent, like I would say, unless you're at like gold, nah, and the gold's not even good, let's be real. Like, it has to be like at least plat. No one knows how to play against these champions. Yeah. So, you know, you go into a team fight, they dump all the CC on you, you just run away and they've just wasted all their alts, everything on you. And then the rest of your team just kill them. And then they're just going, oh, that's unfair. He just ran away. It's like, well, yeah, but you had to know that when I was, co- I, do you not know how the champion works? Like, like me, you must have done this. What what rank do you play at roughly? You don't have to say if you don't want to, but just the rough yeah, like level. Flat two or three. Yeah, okay. So, okay, right, you play at that level, right? When you were back down in gold or whatever, if someone put locks in Master Yi or Katarina, they're the most OP champions ever designed, no matter what year it is, right? Because yeah. they just take over the game. If they get two kills, they're going to get 22 kills. Yeah. And the worst thing is... Even when they have 15 kills and four items, motherfuckers are still going to be fighting them, uh, uh, fighting their support while that guy runs around the team fight killing everyone. Like, they don't even know what the champ does. Like, the maddest thing to me at lower levels in League is the number of people, because they can't all be first-time players, who have played years of League, and when Master Yi goes onto them with, like, the fucking... I think it's the Q, right? The one where you, like, jump onto them for a second. Yeah. They start, like, flashing and stuff. It's like, he follows you, you dumb fuck. Meanwhile, listen, again, I'm not claiming to be a sick player. I love it when the Master Yi comes on me. Because what do you think I do? I go under the fucking tower. I, t- I go into my team, you know. I-, I actually use his ability against him because that's I actually know what his ability does. So I agree. Like, the OP champions, half of the problem in League is, like, mate, the average League player seems so stupid, it's unbelievable. Yeah, for me, the biggest problem now is the when jungle is not the jungle main, you might as well not play. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? So, for me... The, Luckily, I'm Pike, though, so I am the jungler as well, anyway, so don't worry about that, mate. I'll take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's so easy as a jungler to get completely fucked, or me. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, if, if you're a jungle or me, don't know what they're doing. It's just... you. It's very hard to... Well, especially because, again, at low elo... There's the jungle equivalents, like, mate, if you, if someone's never played jungle before or they only occasionally play it and then the other jungler's like Xin Zhao, <laughs> you may as well just fucking dodge this game already, right? There's no chance, like, that he's just going to immediately invade. He's 24-7 going to fuck this guy up. And, you know, like, at level 10, this guy's going to barely have had any of his own jungle. And so it's not even just that he didn't do any good ganks. There's now five players on the other team. You've got four. Yeah, I mean, thank God for those websites like Professor and UGG and so on, where I can just check my team, see who's you know below thirty percent win rate, and just dodge. Oh, there's it another thing. Saves so much stress. How are people playing at any level and not just doing those things that take like five minutes? Like, for example, you look who's in your game, right? That already basically tells you how to play against their comp, doesn't it? Like, oh, this guy's dog shit, and then also you see from the master points, like, oh, and he's barely played this champ. I think I'll just be banging him all day then. Why, I'm not going to go into the guy who's like a god tier master Yi. I'm, I think I'll stay away from him. They're not even doing that. They're actually just playing the game. This is the problem with people playing games for fun. Is people's idea of fun isn't looking stuff up. They think that's hard work. But it's not. It's so easy. It's like it makes it fun seconds. to me. Yeah, it makes it way more fun. Yeah, I know. It's like five seconds. It's just yeah. The and just the stress of you have someone who's not a main and is like just speaking some really shitty hero is just like I'm not going to play have you ever ha- had like a friend who maybe wasn't a league fan or something and then they played it a bit and so they asked you for tips and you give them some th- you, you, you watch them play or you do with them you give them some basic tips like you can level them up <sighs> and not like literally in the sense but in like the figurative sense you can level their skill set up like they they look at you like you're a fucking wizard as you explain how to like gank after a certain time or that like you know, put this ward here. So like, why well, though? It's like, just wait and see. And then, you know, the, the jungle paths, paths that in like a minute, like there we go at this top side now, now you can gank bottom. All oh, right. So if I do that, they, they, they don't even know those basic concepts, mate. Like they're playing jungle and then the other guy's just in fog of war and then they're like, shit, I hope he's not here when I, you know, go down to 10% health on this fucking blue buff. And of course he is, you know, like they're not even figuring out the basic of shit. That's why it's always hilarious to me that again, it, this goes back to the concept of like Reddit consensus. People who read Reddit 
everyone has to pretend they're all super knowledgeable and super good at the game, right? So they always famously are like, why would anyone get lessons from a top streamer or something? It's like, mate, if you really play loads of League of Legends, even if the lesson's $100, that $100, like, as long as you're not poor, that's probably mad worth it. Yeah. Like if I was a low level player and I actually wanted to get good at league and I could play, L- I could pay LS. I don't even know what he charges. I, I, I would imagine he probably charge more than 100 if I guess, maybe 150. I'm sure if you're a sub, you, yeah. There's, Dude, that's worth it. Yeah. Like the shit he's going to tell me, he'll probably get me like a, a few divisions up. He'll get me on the champions that are more fun. I'll know a few matchups. Like it'll make, it'll probably increase my game fun, like 50%. Yeah. I mean, that's how our friend TSM Reggie made all his money, so. It's a proof that's that true. the market is huge. Well, actually, maybe we should tie this analogy in. Because actually, I guess that's not true. It's not true that nobody looks up Guide Zen. It's just that they're not looking up the good ones, are they? So it's kind of like that story I told you about people coming in and finding esports consultants. Well, what if the first place you go is like Mobifier and you're just looking at some fucking clown's guide like, oh, so this is how you build Draven or whatever. Like, And you're just doing some whack-ass build that like, you know, is like some scaling build where you're not even trying to attack them early. Yeah, classic Mobifier builds. Oh, by the way, I'll also say as well, here's another little pro tip for everyone who likes to play Pike. If I'm playing, but with someone who's got like a champion that, you know, this champion should be able to follow up. We should be able to do some good stuff in lane. And then this motherfucker's building like a tear or something. Well, the only tears are going to be coming for you later in that game, mate, because I'm not going to see you for the rest of this game. Like, you're just going to see me on the rest of the map attacking people. (sighs) I'm not sticking around while we get our shit pushed in as you do nothing, you know? Yeah. You know, that must be why Pike doesn't have an insane win rate. Because too many people play it like it's a support. And so, obviously, like if you're playing versus range supports, if you're playing versus a lane that's bad for your ADC, if your ADC is behind, if you can't get lane control, it's one of the shittest champs in the game to play. Like you have to use all your abilities just to farm. Yeah, and you can, you can get uh, you know, denied. If, if the enemy support knows how to play... Of course. Like really well, you just have... Yeah, it, it, it's hard to do something. Um, but yeah, but for me, for me, Pike, the best thing is just the W, I max W second just to go really fast. Yeah, because same for me. With lethality, you just, you just oh, get sick, to the yeah. other side of the map and like, yeah. Especially because like, I don't, listen, because it's such an OP champion, I don't mind the E change because let's be real, like the E before, like... I almost feel bad that I didn't just constantly tell everyone it was OP as fuck because that E where it used to just always catch them was complete bullshit. Like, even though it's like a little bit trickier now, it should be like that. Like, they should be able to semi dodge and you should have to have some skill because you almost have to sort of like bend it onto them, you know? But like, I agree, the W is just so broken. I think that's one of the most broken abilities in the whole game. And with that, the wording item, item that. It's oh, it's just the best. Ridiculous. That's always first item, words. mate. It's just. How is that in the game? I honestly don't understand. It's just so cancer. I mean, I use it obviously, but it's just when I'm playing against someone that has that item, especially if it's Pike, just like why am I even warding? Just giving him thirty gold. <laughs> it's just especially in a world where junglers don't even ward anymore. Yeah. Like if the jungler's only putting down pinks, dude. I basically have like my normal scanner, and then I have this shit that goes off every. Oh, I don't even know what the interval is. It's sixty seconds. Yeah, something like that. So, so it's not that long, I know that. So yeah. before you know it, I've cleared all his wards anyway. Yeah. So How's that fair? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand how that's in the game. One thing I don't get about Pike in that sense is, because I am one of those people, a bit like NBK and CS, like I can acknowledge something's elite, even OP and open fair, even if I like it. Like I genuinely, if, I think Pike, I guess, I, I, guess yeah, I, I just thought of what my problem here is is obviously they didn't create these items just for Pike alone, did they? That's the issue. Because the real problem is, because he's like a champion that snowballs gold, you need it to sort of cost more for him. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that he has the same price cost for every item as everyone else. Then again, maybe I shouldn't suggest some sort of like dynamic pricing thing for fucking League of Legends, because Riot might actually listen and do that. (laughs) And you know they'd do it the worst way possible. Of course. I mean, for me, it's just the the, the ulti can't give that much money. It's just ridiculous. You get yeah, like, exactly. Because you get a kill anyway as well. Come on. 
I mean, you could get double the money, but triple the money. Like, you get the coins and the other guy gets the coins and the kill gold. Like, what the fuck is this? It, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I mean, I just get the max items, like, first, always. It's just, okay. Uh, and also, another good thing that's awesome is because 99% of the Pike players just do, like, what because it, it's so OP, everyone just figures out the most efficient build always and does it. So at the moment, you know, they go, like, the fucking Umbriel thing that you're talking about into, like, I don't know, like a Ghost Blade or um, maybe slightly tanky, maybe you do, like, Dead Man's Play or a Guardian Angel. But everyone tends to do either, like, tons of damage or you go sort of, like, a mix of damage and, a, and you just get some defensive items based on what the other carries have. If you want to have some fun, play at like a, a not high elo and then just build all the tank items with like one sword type weapon. Because here's the fun thing. Because in this scenario, you're not trying to kill everyone, obviously. You're just like dodging in and out and you're last hitting motherfuckers with the ultimate and you're just being an annoyance. You should see what it's like because everyone's trained when you come in to just dump everything on you, aren't they? You should see how sick it is when you have like mad health armor and everything. Like they they just get so tilted because they can't they can't not do it, dude. When you come in, they can't not attack you because their their brains just trained to do it because of all the games they played. Yeah, I mean the health doesn't work, but yeah, the the, the resistance, especially if you have aftershock, it just it, it does become hard to kill and just they waste everything. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, because think about it, they're not going to have loads of armor pen, are they? Yeah, I just go max lethality for ultimate because 50% of the fun is the ultimate. And the ultimate oh, of course, the yeah. 50% is the W. Yeah. Anyway. Although that's the one thing where even people who play... This is actually to tie back into how Dota is different. In Dota, I agree with you. Even if your champ is or hero is OP, yeah, man's OP as well. So if, you, if you're just beating me, I've probably fucked up somewhere along the way. It's not that the champs are broken, right? But here's the bullshit thing. Even I'll complain when, you know, obviously the bane of Pike is all the champions that can just do like some like dodgy shit when, they, when they're at like execution range, but then they can like jump away last second or they can protect <laughs> themselves, right? Even I cry about that. Like, oh, it's unfair. It's like, how is that unfair? Like, am I supposed to be able to kill everyone on the screen? Like... Yeah. It isn't unfair, is it? I should have to play around it just like they're having to play around me being mad OP. Yeah. I mean, like when they flash away. Why did you waste your flash? <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Good times. Like, I actually genuinely think Pike will go down in history eventually. Because here's the thing. I don't think it'll ever leave the meta 100%. I think it'll be like a thresh where it'll always have some conditional use. And it'll definitely always be in solo queue. So I think one day it will go down as like one of those insane, like, how did that get launched like that? Like, you know, like the fucking original CZ in CS and the fucking, yeah. r- the yeah. original release of Zijiao, which was just like, <laughs> everything was just yeah, OP as fuck, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, even last year when it was in theory low win odds, when G2 was playing it mid with the AOE damage, it was just like, yeah, this can't, <laughs> we have to nerf it. It's like, well, why are you nerfing? A champ that's not even mid, but yeah, it just... No, I agree. It, the, the champ has too, too many things. Too low. Is there any other topic you want to go to? What should we pivot to? I just have a, a small one. You touched it a bit on the TL side of things, but for me it's more... Now that Double Lift is gone, and they have all their contracts uh, probably finishing soon, what is the move? Because they've been spending all this money... Is there a world where they just scale back and just become like a normal, whatever that means, org? Or do they kind of are they stuck now into always spending to go for number one? Because I mean, it's not even like they made playoffs and did decent; they just got screwed. So, yeah, what, what do you think is the the plan now? Yeah, well, that's also by the way why the concept of like, well, my my goal is I'm just going to spend the most money and win. It's like, man, that doesn't even always happen. Like, that's hard. <laughs> still hard to win. Like, like I always quote that classic quote. I, I say it a million times because he's just one of the best of all time where Johan Cruyff, when he was the manager of like Barcelona, just said, I've never seen a bag of money score a goal. Because obviously, yeah. you know, you could have, like, listen, just go and ask someone who was a fan of like, I don't know, fucking Fernando Torres when he played for Chelsea. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much they cost, mate. You can get some kid who's 19 years old who might bang in 20 goals. It might be free. So in the same sense, like, spending big you basically have to win at that point in time it's like you you're like win the championship or bust and so not only do i think that's dodgy because it's going to be really hard to get a team that is as dominant as the one they had before 
But even worse, I also think that... Um, let me think how you would phrase this. The big problem is it's almost impossible to make rosters at the moment that were better than last year's TL roster. Right. Because if you notice, every off-season, you get these amazing rumors and you hear interviews. You you must have heard them yourself. I mean, if, if you listen to that episode of The Crackdown I did with Dom, we revealed them all. Like, yeah. people were trying to sign fucking Chovy. And they were offering him, by the way, way more than he gets in Korea. People were offering to Faker. People were offering to The Shy. People... Dude, this is not a joke. We're at the point now where, in theory, Team Liquids of the world, they could do what the idiot fan says. You know when the idiot fan's like, they've raised another 10 million. Lol, they should sign Faker. And you know, people like me are like, that makes no business sense whatsoever. Well, listen, joke's on me because some of those owners are like, but I am trying to sign Faker. And it's like, all right, mate, well, pff, you you know, it'll be your funeral. The problem is, first of all, even if you manage to sign Chovy or Faker or Uzi I, Right, like you're probably only signing one of them and then still putting them with, you know, a bunch of good players, Bjergsen and someone else, or, you know, whatever, or double lift or whatever, you know, put them with like good players. Well, at that, at that point in time, it's like putting Hooney on dig. Even if Hooney had been old Hooney, you still wouldn't have won the league. So you'd have yeah. wasted the money anyway. And because obviously the rest of the team wouldn't have been a Hooney level at the t- concept we're talking about. So not only can you at the moment probably not actually accomplish what you want to with those players. But then even worse, you can't even get them. It's crazy. You just can't. Yeah. And if you're a TL, you might even have VG and Hernan Thieves trying to steal, you know, Jensen or like... Impact. Yeah, exactly. So what, 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 but also what do you think they should do? Should, should they, you know, just get some more tacticals or should they just, you know, go back to... You know, basically try to keep the roster and adding... One I personally team. don't think you should actually make super teams. I know that sounds mad because G2 is a super team, but first of all, I mean, they literally are contending for the world championship. Like, <laughs> they are going to win. Like, so they're at least meeting that condition. And then secondly, I mean, that team is so great in the server. I might be willing to just lose millions just to fucking watch them play. Like, <laughs> I mean, why are we here in esports if we don't like the games? But if you're Team Liquid, where you're probably not going to win Worlds, and even your super team, like, let's be real, watching Team Liquid play last year, it's not watching them play that was my favourite part about them. It was the, the fact they were a consistent team and they could win. Like, watching them play was actually fairly boring, I thought. Like, you know, it was kind of obvious yeah. what they were going to do. So what I would also say in that scenario is, to me, the future of the game should be investing as much as you can into your coaching staff and your scouting, and then you just pick let's say two star players and they're the ones I'm going to spend all my money on. So maybe I do get Chovy and then maybe, you know what? Maybe this is how I do it. I get one massive free agent. I get Chovy. Then I get one really good player. I get double lift, right? That alone already, I've got the carry threat to win LCS right there. So now what I put around them, cause I've got a brilliant coaching staff and really good scouting. Now, instead of being like the idiot who's in LCS, like, oh, look, Fucking hell, Mad Lions is good. It's like, no, no, I've got Shadow as my jungler. I'm going to take a chance on him. Because here's the other thing. He's not going to cost millions. I'm actually going to get him quite cheap. And if he doesn't work out, you know how junglers are, mate. They're 10 a penny. Yeah, if he doesn't yeah. work out, now I'm going to get the self-made before he goes to a Fnatic. Because remember, the real key here is SK Game... Dude, self-made at the moment looks like he has a chance to be Yankos in a few years, right? Yeah. And he was playing for fucking SK Gaming in the LEC. Yeah. I can only imagine how little he was getting paid and how limited his options were because even the people who occasionally watched the European leagues, the national leagues, this is the key thing. It's not about watching them. It's that they don't know what they're looking at. Like, I won't lie. I have a very hard time evaluating, like, some of the, like, um, concepts of how a player would fit into a team. So I'm mainly using the eye test and then using things I know from other games, you know. It's not a joke. Unless you have someone like Veteran LS, it wouldn't. It almost wouldn't even matter if you looked at all the people in the National Leagues. You'd just pick the wrong person. Hence why fucking Iker is the player you pick up from LDLC, not the actual players that were carrying the team. So I think basically for me, you spend big on the roles that have to carry 
And then all the other roles, it's like football. You pick up some people who are like, you know, you, you, like here's an example. You gamble on a Soaz when he's on an off year because if he comes back, now I've got three really sick players, but I'm not paying one of them sick money. Then for a jongler, maybe you try like a young, hot jongler. He only has to be good for me this year. If he's bad, try another one next year. You get a support who just works with the AD carry you've got. It doesn't have to be that good. It is a fucking role, as we said. Me and you were just playing it, watching like an anime on the other monitor or whatever. Like, the, I actually think people have... The problem is the super team concept's kind of a waste of time in the league, especially with the monetization we have now. Yeah. I mean, basically, haven't I just described what sort of what Cloud9 did? Yeah, but they got yeah they got a good good combo. They did spend loads of money on. I mean, I don't understand where that amount came from or yeah. How yeah, but they also. But it worked out. So. They also sold those people to EG though. That's the genius That's move, true. wasn't it? That's true. That they were basically like, right, let me sell you these two players. Thanks, you've just paid for all my roster move. You know, like that's that. That's why I can't lie. Jack does seem like an absolute gangster now after doing that. Yeah, it's amazing how he turns around and even like even the lineup for in CS, it's like I mean it's not it's not killing it, but it's like for the names that he has in the server, it still does you know always a bit. Oh, it's better, better than it should be. Yeah, the real sad thing about Cloud Nine is this is where it fans themselves. This is why I, like my number one beef with esports is everyone else is telling me they're the expert and I know nothing. And then I listen to their opinions and their opinions are like, dude, are you like blind or something? Like, are you even watching the game? Like, what are you talking about? So as a result, you have people who are, who have like ridiculous opinions, like um, that all those Cloud9 rosters that he made in 2018 were only a moron would make those teams. The fuck are you talking about? Like, those were sick gambles. Yeah, Remember, yeah. at one point in time, he was going to have Golden, by the way, now considered one of the best IGLs, and then the players he was going to have with him was Flusher, fucking Kiyoshima, Automatic, later on he had Cajun B. Like, these are players you can make work, mate. Like, these lineups, if they'd have ever had caught a bit of luck and had a nice, like, one month at least when no one's injured, as a standing or like they could have really done something with some of those lineups. Like I actually saw, and, and then the other part that's really, really brutal is because they had so many bad things happen in a row for like a year straight, combined with wasting the money, paying all these people. Yep. Then you got the situation where players just wanted to leave. Well, the thing that people never stopped and thought about is this, right? Think about the team that was Golden, Kiyoshima, Automatic, Flusher, right? Let's say that team gets decent, right? It becomes the 10th best team in the world, the eighth best team in the world. Well, now I go and I get Nico and I pop him in that team. Dude, that might be it. We might already be contending for number one. We were we were one piece away. It's just we didn't have that one piece. But you'd have built the place where that guy might come. Because the problem with the Nikos of the world is we're not at the point yet. They're kind of like the Chovies of the world. They're not going to join just because you pay them the money and play on a shit team. But if you can say, here's the money and... I've basically got you the support and cast and you're going to be my star. Hey, I might join then. Yeah. That's how Flashpoint, I think, will actually succeed. There'll be a, it won't even be just signing entire teams. It's that you'll get a core who, is, who are good enough and then you'll chuck a couple of superstar players in there. Yeah. It still blows my mind that that C9 lineup you mentioned, like they, they I mean, obviously there's player issues and so on, but at the time they basically blew up and all of them, got worse or got in a worse situation. So it's just like, they really must not like Yoshima. <laughs> just, no, I mean, listen. Jesus, yeah. Put it this way. G2 literally <laughs> decided to recruit Serbian people <laughs> rather than let Kiyoshima play with them. They literally looked over at fucking Jax and Armanek and said, listen, you're going to have to speak English all the time. And that's literally going to hurt our team. But fuck having Kiyoshima and understanding what he's saying in French. Like... <laughs> Actually, it's not even that. It's not even that he's toxic in that way. The real problem with him is that he just every at certain points in his career he just acts like an arsehole in terms of like stuff like practice and things like that. So, like that is the number one thing that will wear on you. Yeah, but still you're in Club Nine, you know, getting paid probably decent. But, I mean, luckily, you know, Flesh and Golden and so on now are are doing well in Fnatic, but they could have just ended their careers there. I mean, it, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh it, no, I'm with you. No, the real problem as well is players are insanely short-sighted. Because remember, because a player is doing his job every day, they just think day-to-day. -day. They really do. 
yeah. or they think the next one or two events. That's why they famously overreact and kick someone or recruit someone who's definitely not good enough, but they've had like, you know, one good tournament and suddenly he's in the fucking top team. And you're like, like obvious example with like my own. It's yeah. like, holy shit, dude. Like, even if you think he's good, I mean, listen, I know business-wise it's now impossible to sign once so you know they're good, but you'd want you'd want him to be tested in the other teams as in terms of to watch you know that the gamble's worth it. Yeah. Especially if it's another country in that case. So actually, one of the hardest things, like I say, is basically to build a team because none of the players are going to believe as you're putting the first pieces on the board, they're not going to be able to see where it could end up. You almost have to come out the gate with a sick lineup, else they're not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, and they just—it's like the double if living liquid and so on. It's like okay, they had one bad split, and it just all blows up, and it's just like it, you could have kept together Any, anyway. It's, I, I, I'll tell you another angle as well that I hate. I also think even in CS:GO, we have some really bad negotiating and recruitment going on, because another thing people do is unless they just make the standard type of team, this is why the whole international argument to me is actually a, a mild straw man, is the way that FaZe and Mouse Sports have done the international lineup is the most extreme version possible. It's not even necessary. Like, here's what I don't get. Why not have an international lineup that's like three Danish people who all play together with good team play, and then I pop like Nico next to them and someone else. Yeah, or more Nordic teams that just like... Or, or, or just a superstar player, yeah. Maybe I have, you know, Olaf Meisterwim or something like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, I said that as though he was a star player. Like, obviously, I was thinking of the old school Olaf Meister. Yeah, yeah. the old times. Because you wouldn't... Uh, like, that's another thing that's really flawed, is when you make a team brand new, well, no one knows what it's going to be like. If you just buy a core that's already successful and then upgrade it, yeah. chances of that working is pretty good, probably like 70% or something. I feel like it's it's pretty on the nose. Yeah, especially if you start with a good one piece, like the a good carry that attracts others. If not, you're a bit screwed. I mean, isn't I, I have basically the best example ever? It's probably like simple to team liquid, right? Yeah, that was yeah. That took a team that was like eleventh in the world, and th dude, they were in a major final. That they, they, I mean, they could have, they should have won. Almost, I don't know. It's just they could have won the MLG Columbus one, maybe. I think. Yeah, yeah, it was it was insane. I mean, now I actually, Team as bad as it sounds, they really could have won a major. Imagine that. And now that might not seem much because Team Liquid has done well, but at the time it was unthinkable. It was like, what is this? Uh, yeah. It's By the way, do you remember? Because I just wanted, just wanted to like check if what you remember of the time. Do you remember how fans used to like criticize Simple back then? What that it was uh, raging and so on. No, 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 that's the dumbest thing. Not even just for the toxicity. They used to literally like imply that like he was mad overrated in game. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, for example, the kind of person who's like, like, listen, obviously they wouldn't hate on him and say he had bad aim or anything, yeah. but they found genius ways to do that. So, for example, you know, he had that famous thing where when he would move around, he would have like, he wouldn't like track the, every corner. He would sort of have his crosshair like at floor level and shit like that, you know, right? Even though that didn't affect him getting kills, they would be like, yeah, but you know, he'll always be held back because he's a flawed player. And you're like, what? That's like I'm running on my hands and scoring 30 goals in the Premier League. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, it works, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then similarly, they always used to also claim, this is so mental if you think about who simple is as a player. They would claim that he should play more conservatively and probably with the rifle instead of the AWP because he's not a true AWPer. And also, his aggressive moves, they would literally say this cliche. They would say, yeah, he'll win you games, but he'll lose you games as well. I challenge anyone to go out there, even when Simple was at the Team Liquid era, even when he was initially in Na'Vi, go find me the games that he's losing for the team. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the genius is... Now, obviously, there's not even a debate, is there? The aggressive moves he's making now are, like, the most effective in the history of Counter-Strike. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for that called Zero, the op, double, crazy stuff, I mean, they should, I mean, they could have been a whole different history. Didn't you find it cool, though, that in the interviews with Fallen and with Dead, they literally straight up agree that that was mad fluke? And that, you know, they really thought even in that game that they were going to lose. That's actually cool that they admit that because obviously they wouldn't have won the major otherwise. Yeah, it was like 15 something, 59 or 15, 10 or something. 
it was yeah uh anyway it's so rare people admit shit like that though i mean that case <laughs> yeah it was it was crazy i still yeah i still can't believe that that, that was even possible but anyway i mean it shouldn't really have been that's also one of the weirdest things, isn't it? You know what? I'll say this, and obviously I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek, but this will literally be put into a video on Vax Socks where they'll be claiming that I'm like, you secretly dropped some breadcrumbs to expose all the cheating. When you think of some of the shit that happened at Majors, the John Cold Zero one, I mean, it goes without saying the simple one versus Fnatic. Yeah, that's right. Like, I still think to this day, the reason that's the best clip ever is when he goes for the second shot, you still don't think it should hit. Your yeah. brain tells you it's not going to hit. So when it hits, you literally just think like, what? it's like the Neo in the Matrix moment when he first starts dodging the bullets. Yeah. You're like, how can this be? This is um, this is impossible. Uh, yeah, that one is, is even... That almost made... So anyway, the point I was going to say was, there's been too many of those clips at majors. That almost makes it look like they all do cheat. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's always when everyone's looking and just people remember forever, basically. Uh, even, so, I mean, some crazy, it's not the same level, but like the the device pistols, if five eight. That was still wild in itself, like, yeah. That, that's from, uh, how is this even possible if you're not, uh, yeah, cheating? I, I think about how rarely you ever see that. And so the idea it's happening, and we're talking about games, notice all three of these games are games where it's like, you're either facing a really difficult opponent you've got to be, or you might even be the underdog. And then all of a sudden, you're just pulling out some crazy-ass bullshit like that that essentially wins you the game. Like, what? Yeah. And that was like that was like round one of the game as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, that's why CS is, you know, the best to watch. Just this crazy. Oh, completely, yeah. There's no equivalent to that in League, let's face it. Yeah. Still waiting for the Valorant ones. Oh, he dropped the grenade from his arm and <laughs> then the ice thing. Anyway, we'll see how that goes. Let me think. What would be it? Who are your like favorite teams in CS? I mean, Astral basically the slow ones, Astralis. Uh, All right, what about that then? Probably. Do you actually buy the narrative that Astralis is like cooling off or maybe falling off or there's some something's going on there? Do you buy it? I have I mean I cannot justify in any way the six man decision unless it's really to fuck with Heroic. <laughs> like it's just it, it makes no sense. Unless it's I think one of your co hosts said it's basically to let the device rest and you you just basically either the carpal tunnel or whatever he has and they want to, uh, I don't know, take a few months with with uh, some random uh, lineup to then maybe come back in later. Otherwise, I, I honestly don't know what they're doing. Um, I mean, I still think that they're very good and they probably can be the best, but it's hard. Like, no lineup now has lasted this long with this level of success. So I think it's, yeah, uncharted territory. They're basically making it up as they go. It's not even like VP in the past where they were, the reason they stayed together is because if they fell apart, they really fell apart. Here, they, they do have options. They, do, they can be between first and fifth place. So, yeah, it, it's, I think it's even hard. Even the hard only thing is, decisions. like one area that's going to get dodgy is, as you might have seen, the Astralis group had all their employees take a 30% pay cut and then they had their goal to actually say it was fucking voluntary, which doesn't make any sense at all. So when they did this, right, what they essentially signaled to you is we've got to cut money now and obviously we don't have money to spend. So people won't realize this, but just because you're Astralis doesn't mean you can buy Nico. You yeah. probably can't. And you probably wouldn't, quite frankly. So as a result, as mad as it sounds... Esetag is probably the type of player you're going to be getting. Because it doesn't matter anymore that Valde would want to join. Do I want to sell him? I've just bought him out myself. I might just yeah. say it's $2 million and then you're not even going to consider that. That wouldn't even be on the table for Astralis right now. So as a result, I mean, they'd be looking to sell their team for that, I'd imagine. So as a result, you look at the cl current global state, they're actually going to be in a tough spot because at the moment, like Mad Lions and North... These aren't orgs that have to sell. They can just sit on those players if they want. 
And so the reason why it's brutal, it's why I compare it to MIBR, is I've said this many, many times. I know that Fallen would have had Yuri and Kesarato already. Yeah. And in fact, by now, he'd have even had time to work on them and they'd probably be like contending for the major or something. So it's not that he couldn't make the moves. It's not, or rather, it's not that he didn't know the moves. He couldn't make them. So I think Astralis might be in a similar scenario. Yeah, that's a fair point. I guess in my head, I'm still thinking who wouldn't want to join, you know, the Vice and the Gang to be... Oh, I agree, one yeah. ...contesting for number one. But that also depends on the business angles and all that sort of shit, you know. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they're probably not the top bidders, um, you know, to Valde and so on. He's probably making more now than he would at Astralis, that's for sure. So, yeah, in that sense, yes. But I still... Th- I mean, do you think that they're... They couldn't, with the five that they have, just keep trying for number one? Or do you think it just, you know... It... Oh, I think they can. I just, here's the thing. It's not even that they did anything wrong to stop being the best team ever. Like, it was the other way around. Like, I don't know how they did that. Like, it was it was impossible. Half the shit they did, like, seems like... When I think back on it now, bear in mind it was, like, a year and a half ago. Yeah. You, you can Literally, in your brain, yeah, you can remember the games... But it's still hard to believe that someone was actually playing at that level almost every game. It still doesn't seem right like it could happen. But then why don't they sell or whatever? Like if you'd sell, let's say, Zibnix, if you assume he's the one playing the worst, uh, what, you could sell him for some money, I think. So sure. why not have just a normal five-man lineup? That, that's what people know works. Um, yeah, exactly. I agree. That's why it sound, That's why as soon as I hear that, I mean, first of all, whatever they tell me, luckily when you work, when you, if you've learned what serial liars are like, they're very predictable. You just listen to the opposite of what they say. So yeah. when they tell me it's definitely for like competitive reasons, I know immediately it's probably not for that. And then I started theory crafting ideas. And yeah, one of them I came up with is it's to either give a player a break and then not have everyone go mental about Blastralis here again. Or the other angle is, it's a way to slowly move someone out the door. Maybe that is a Dupree. Maybe that is a Zipnix. And you know, initially they take one event off. And then remember, as you're testing the other guy, if he starts to get at all good, now we can even shift out this legendary player and it won't even necessarily be fanfare because people will remember, ah, Stratus was like the fourth best team. Oh shit, they might be number one now. Fans are fickle in that way. Like I think I think that it would even work. As, as much as to me, that seems pretty obvious. If they do it, by the way, you know what you're trying to accomplish there. I feel as though fans would forgive you, as long as you get a number one team again. But even the, I mean, we don't have like the rules like in league and so on, where if you have a series, you can swap in the jungler or something like that. Sure. And even in league where you can do that, it's usually a horrible idea to have a six man roster, or you know the ones that uh, if they have the ADC dividing time with with the academy player or whatever, that never works, or it's always they both get pissed or one gets pissed and leave. So I think they're just, you know, going on an awkward bunch of months to then do the obvious thing. So I still think it's it doesn't make sense unless they can't decide if they want to kick out Zipnix or if they think, oh shit, in the end it was the pillar even if it was just doing support. That I could understand. Um, or maybe they have I don't know. It, it it's still I don't think it's a good move uh, to have six players, but maybe they'll make it work. I don't know. Especially if, if anyone could, it'd be them, obviously. Yeah. And if you're going to do the thing where the, the coach might be able to speak in some tournaments, can the sixth player also speak? Like, is that any help? So maybe, you know, one of the secondary colors is also helping. I, I don't know. I, I still struggle to find a good reason to have a six man. But no, I, still I, hope. I still think that they'll be good. I mean, again, might not be number one, but... I mean, you never write off the greatest teams ever, mate. You've got to give them a chance. Especially now that they've done it again and again. It's like... Like, the only reason I write off the dig core is because I gave them all the chances. They've had about a thousand of them. Yeah. And by the way, remember, this is this is how greedy fans are and how delusional they are. That Like, if you, they think it's like if they believe in someone enough, they'll just become good, like, magically. Dude, they not own... The reason I made the nip magic term is they'd already had their time at the top. And then these motherfuckers for the next two years still kept stealing trophies somehow, yeah. which is cool, but they were stealing those motherfuckers. Like yeah. they would just win it in the next tournament. They'd come, what, like seventh or something? Yeah, I mean, even the major they won was, was like, that, that's when they shouldn't win it. Like they should have won it before. Yeah, agreed. No, so no. the idea that like, like 
here's the thing. Once you've seen them fail as consistently as they used to succeed, well, now you can just predict against them. I agree, though. As long as Astralis stays anywhere within, like, say, the top five or six, they'll always still have a chance to do it just because of, like, that level of experience, the basic things they've built up together, generally how good the best players in the team are. You know something sexy, though? I'll give you a cool angle. Right, obviously, as long as Glaive's there and as long as he's not one of the people who would potentially leave, it's probably going to be a very tactical team and it's probably going to be the way it is. But we've heard these hints that maybe Zonic's thinking about retiring. Remember, he's having like a young family at home. He's yep. what's all about travel at the moment. Right, if we ever get to a world where Glaive is gone, mm-hmm. it doesn't even matter that you have Device, Magisk, these players. You're not going to be what Astralis was. So I tell you what, I would actually love to see in like 2021 or 2022, which is, if you remember what Device was like when he was in the Astralis team when Glaive first got there, where he was literally like, no joke, he was like a top three player in the world. He might even have been the best player in the world. He was dropping mad numbers. He was still an AWPA, but he was like, the difference is, he wasn't as safe as he is now because obviously he has help now. He would try to hard carry the game. I would love to see a team that's like a traditional Counter-Strike team where you kind of have the two carries and then you have like a good player, then you have a support element, you have an IGL. I'd love to see that, but with Magus and Devices, the carries. And actually put the resources into these motherfuckers and just ride those two horses. And then the other players, their jobs just, you know, do their role. It'd be a totally different team, but you could be a number one team doing that. Yeah, that's a totally... I guess my, for me, the, uh, what I think is more likely is... And maybe the game switches and being tactical isn't as good anymore. And maybe you have, you know, a simple and eco, uh, these teams with, or Team Liquid that have ultra fraggers back to the top again. And then they have to change something and then they decide to do that. Or maybe, in, I know, if the coaches can now speak, maybe they do move Glaive back to the coaching, um, you know, being the sixth man. Yeah, that would, that would be just, interesting, certainly. Bring someone in with more firepower, even though. Especially, especially Glaive, because, uh, like, the problem with Glaive is, I can't say he's, he's not good at fragging because obviously he had tournaments where he's the fucking MVP, which is unbelievable as an IGL. Yeah. But it is overrated in as much as like it happens so rarely in terms of like big numbers. So yeah. it's not like it would be egregious to ask him to become a coach, especially because in the modern day, especially someone like that that was in the org, it's not like the old days of me saying become a coach. And then what I'm actually saying as well is, by the way, if it doesn't work out too much, I'll fire you and you might not even get another job. Yeah. You know, the odds are it's like a real job and you'd get paid the same salary. You know, you'd, you might even be able to control the game more, like you say. Like if you put another weapon in his in his place, I mean, who knows what Glaive could do with that? I'd love to see it. Yeah, and you don't have to, you know, spend the hours of the day playing. You can just, you know, do some tactics, some nades and so on. That's probably what he likes to do better. It's probably easier for him to do that all day sure. than trying to keep up with the simples. This video was kindly supported by Alexander Rao, Dean Tanglis, J Dobbs, Nate D-O-double-G, Tobias Bernasconi, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my boy Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you want to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA. Do you want teasers? Who are the guests on the upcoming talk shows, interviews I have? Maybe you want to take part in one of those Patreon donator discussions with me. Well, for any of the above perks and more, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.